All right, so good start to think about uh, all ages learning and growing in the Lord. And our theme today as we wrap up this series, it's Habakkuk, Hope Shines in the Dark. And this conclusion for today called Rejoicing Still, Rejoicing Still. And uh, we'll look at those concluding verses in a moment. And uh, as I think about the, the book of Habakkuk and where we've been, whether you're watching and, and listening right now today for the first time, or you've been with us through all five weeks, um, uh, I hope you have been or will be blessed by this. And this theme of rejoicing still um, is one that uh, I think is a great way to end. And it's thinking about how Habakkuk ends, because the book has been dealing with dark days, right, all the way through. Um, we know all about those kinds of dark days as we think about stuff around us in our world, individually, too. Uh, we all experience them in different degrees. And how do we handle it? Uh, Habakkuk is crying out honestly to God, isn't he? This whole book. He's been lamenting. He's been worshiping. He's been praising God. He's been, as we see today, fearful and wondering, God, why don't you do something? Why don't you do anything about what we're going through? And, and God is telling him, I'm going to do something all right, and I'm going to send an enemy army that's going to conquer you and discipline you. And he goes, what? God, that's not what I had in mind. Can't we do something different? Uh, and he assures Habakkuk, well, I will deal with the injustice of this nation, uh, Babylon. Uh, but, and so as, as Habakkuk hears God's response, and in chapter 3, he had a song of praise, this corporate worship song of praise that he created and, and led the people in. And if you remember last week, there's affirmations of God who saves us, he's with us, he's for us. And these last few verses move again, as we've been going through the whole book, from fear and, and unknown to praise and ultimately to joy. Uh, over these weeks, as we hear different news reports of all stuff in our world, ranging from COVID to Afghanistan, hurricanes, all the other stuff personally we're going through with family, kids, jobs, school starting, some kind of normal someday coming, uh, things come and go. And I just ask you, have you ever felt during some of these weeks and months that, that you just you've been robbed of joy? It's just like all this stuff in the world has just... Uh, sucked all the joy out of my heart. And um, maybe you've felt that way from time to time. I know I have. And then maybe something comes back and gives you some reassurance. I, I hope we do. We are reassured every time we gather together, aren't we, about God's promises, even as we worship or as we have a phone call with each other, or as we see care being given to those in need and uh, all the good things that we can be about. That gives us joy that's restored, doesn't it? Even hearing those, those kids' voices just shouting out God's word, it's like, okay, God's up to something. There's another generation rising up that's uh, getting familiar with God's word in their heart, right? And that can help us restore that joy. And um, I believe Habakkuk shows us ultimately as we move through these last few verses how we can have joy even when everything seems to be falling apart. And as we'll see at the start of this small section of verses, Habakkuk gives us an example of how we go from fear to joy. So I'm going to first read uh, 16 through 19 of chapter 3, and hear this progression of Habakkuk that we'll talk about. As he reflects back on what is going to happen, what the Lord has told him will happen, and there's both expectation of deliverance, but fear in the short term, immediate term as well. So he writes, I heard these words, and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come, on, come to the nation invading us, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, 
Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. And it says at the end, it's for the director of music, as this is set to song for the people to praise God in the midst of the, of the challenges ahead. So I'd like us to reflect on this for a moment. And I think, first of all, in this set of verses, Habakkuk gives us an example of what it means to really show just real and raw emotions. Uh, he basically says, I know what you've said, God, and I'm scared. I think my body is shaking. Ever been that afraid? Ever been that upset or really literally afraid about something? Um, I would like to see if I got any responses here today uh, about fear and uh, some probably some pretty... Serious ones, maybe some lighter ones too, but fear is pretty heavy. Um, wow, Joan, thank you for your honest response here. Uh, Joan Thorne, there was a time in my life when I woke up every night at about 2 a.m. with panic attacks. I was fearful for unknown reasons. I would say the Lord's Prayer over and over until my fear was gone and fell back to sleep and awoke in the morning knowing God had got me through the night. Wow, that's an honest reflection. Um, Linda, here today, thank you for your response. Afraid when my son was very sick, both physically and mentally, praise God, he recovered. I overcame my fear with much prayer, some patience, good doctors, and great support from friends. Amen. I mean, and that's, isn't that where we see God at work in all those ways, through prayer, through people? I know, uh, one time, I've been a couple times, I was trying to think about instances to share, but uh, I may have shared this with some of you, and, but I, I remember, I love to go to the beach, and you know, the beach can be kind of wild, and this was when we were down in Southern California, and it was later in the afternoon, actually early evening in the fall, and sun was going down, and my son, after his soccer practice, we decided to go to surf um, at the beach, and uh, go to the beach, and it was kind of heavy surf, and I wasn't you know, my son's so quick and agile. Andrew, this is Andrew, not Caleb, but our next, my next oldest son, Andrew. And um, he wanted to go. And I said, oh, I'll, I'll go with you. We got both our boards on the car. And, you know, he was able to get out quicker than I was. I just kept getting hit back by the waves and I couldn't even make it out. And I go, I'll just watch and I'm fine. <laughs> and then the next thing I know, after a few minutes anyway, I saw his board drift back into the sand, onto the sand. But Andrew wasn't on the board. And I kind of panicked. I couldn't see. The waves were high enough. I couldn't see over that horizon of the wave. And I thought, you think the worst. You think he's going to sink to the bottom of the ocean, and that's it, right? And I, saw, I said, okay, I better get out there. And I, with everything I got, I was able to finally make it outside of that, that breaking waves. And there he was, just kind of treading water. <laughs> and you know, I just what are you doing? <laughs> I thought you were dead. You know, it was that kind of fear and then <sighs> relief. And I'm thinking, are you okay? Can you, he, yeah, I'm just going to swim in. Okay. And then that was it. <laughs> we were done and we went back home. But uh, fear and then relief when those fears are either overcome as a couple of you expressed or, uh, or, they, or they vanish. Like, oh, it wasn't, sometimes our fears aren't you know, what they say most of the things that you fear are going to happen. I don't know, some ridiculous statistic, 99% of the things we fear about never happen, right? Any other just short answers or quick reflections on that, a time where you're fearful? I know it's kind of close to just be able to shout out a one-word answer, but uh, have you all been shaken in your boots at one time or another for some reason or another? Something that happened? Maybe, maybe not. I want us to think about Habakkuk because, yeah, I think as I read this passage, the first thing I thought of was that phrase, Habakkuk was shaken in his boots, cared to the core, but his response, yet, I will wait patiently. In verse 16, yet. And I think this word yet is interesting because, you know, we always hear our kids say when they're in the back of the car and we're on a long trip, are we there yet? 
are we there yet? And here, though, so it's usually not at the beginning of a sentence, but Habakkuk says right there, yet, in verse 16. My legs trembled, next sentence, yet I will wait patiently. And it just a whole, brings a whole new meaning to that little three-letter word. But, uh, and, and waiting, too, if, I believe as we look deeper into the Hebrew language, it's not just a waiting like, oh, I got to wait for this. I'm on hold for mind-numbing 60 minutes to get to the whatever I need to talk to, you know, a, a service tech or a doctor or something like that. Ever been on hold and the mind-numbing little music's playing? And you think, oh, wait, wait, wait. But for, in the Hebrew language, waiting isn't just sitting around and waiting. And think about this. It's a sense of rest and peace. Even though I'm trembling, as Habakkuk was, even though I'm scared, I'm at rest. It's like, what? <laughs> how does that, how can that connect? How does that make sense? Sorrow, tension, literally shaking in his boots, as Habakkuk is, yet I'm at rest. And so, as I, I think about this, I'm just going to double check and see if there's another one. Oh, I got one more scary moment here. Isa said, Scariest moment, my husband got hospitalized due to an infection and so afraid of losing him. And she prayed and gave her husband over to the Lord. So, being at rest, I think that's another example of, and in so many words, maybe Isa even could say, okay, yes, there's that fear, but, you know, God is with me. So we have emotions, most of us, or can be just like, you know, just wound up, right? And who knows what's going to set us off when we're, as our emotions get the best of us. Uh, I, I've, we've been praying for, as many of you on our prayer team and our, receiving the prayer list uh, uh, that comes out, we've been praying for Art Morales, haven't we? Art's uh, been battling uh, cancer, brain cancer, and apparently, as Judy was sharing with me even last night, it's moved to stage four, so it's a very, very uh, difficult, to say the least, and uh, even terminal. And we're prayerful, though, aren't we? We pray for Art. We pray for Judy. And Judy said a really powerful thing. She says, you know, in the midst of all this, our lives are in God's hands. And uh, uh, what a place of rest, even last night, as she was corresponding with me. No, it doesn't take away pain. It doesn't take away sadness, but there's that ultimate rest or that ultimate peace that uh, can pass all understanding through God, through Christ. So Habakkuk says, I know what's coming. I know this isn't going to be good, but he says, I know your promises. Your truth will reign. Your justice will come on our enemies. You are faithful. And I think what, part of what Habakkuk shows us is, yes, emotions are, are real. God can handle them. Uh, acknowledge these types of feelings that we have. Don't just bury them. And as believers, I think we have the freedom to express those emotions and in a good way. Because when we don't express them and it just gets pent up within us, who knows what's going to happen. As we think about all the stresses of this year and year, two years, you know, COVID, other things. Some people have been affected more directly than others, and our prayers continue to go out to hospital workers, military, frontline doctors, others serving. And, you know, we go along our day-to-day -day lives, and we try to care for our families and, and do our daily work that we have to do. Uh, some have experienced job loss. And, yeah, emotions are real in this time. Some Christians think, oh, well, I just got to be stoic and put on a, you know, stern face and just trudge through it. It's going to, if I'm going to make it, it's up to me. Uh, um, or, you know, and then there's people think, oh, no, I just have to be joyful and happy all the time and look like I've just got everything going right, no matter what they, was really going on on the inside. And neither of those things are true. It's not just putting up a stern face and charging on my own, and it's not just fake face of happy, joyful Habakkuk shows us the reality, and like I said, we bury these things. Habakkuk didn't. He expressed them raw and real. If we just bury it, sometimes that anger comes out. That anxiousness within us just lashes out at others, and 
And, uh, uh, you know, if, I, do, we, do we agree that sometimes it's just okay not to be okay? And we can share that with the trusted friend, with the uh, person that can pray for us. And uh, if you, you know, connect with us, connect with our prayer team, connect with Coco or Dana or Hillary or I in the office or people in your, in your, um, uh, your home group, your community group, uh, you know, and talk to me, call me. We'd like to, we'd love to pray for one another and encourage one another through these times. And, you know, it's, it's on the other hand, if we do just kind of hold it all in, we end up like the guy that, you know, burns his grilled cheese sandwich as he's thinking of 10 different things, and he just takes a sandwich and he throws it on the wall. You know, how's your anger, how's your pent-up aggression going to go out on a grilled cheese sandwich stuck on the wall or something like that? And hopefully nothing worse than that, right? I see in, in Jesus some real emotion, too. We see and Jesus weeping, that short verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35, he wept, didn't he, at the loss of a friend, a Lazarus, who had died. And we see his anger when he sees people being taken advantage of, the money changers in the temple. We see Jesus, you know, righteous anger about abuse, people abusing others. We see uh, in prophecies, like in the book of Isaiah, that he was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. All these feelings that come from each day, uh, I think a couple things that I just start with this, but continue to share them and talk about them with others. But identify your feelings, take them to Jesus. Ultimately, I pray and I believe you will experience his peace. Cast all our anxieties on Jesus. He cares for you. He cares for me, even in turmoil. So where is your trust and where is your hope? We're going to move in this uh, passage as, as we look at verses 7 through 19. And the Habakkuk writes in these words, Yeah, even though the fig tree, it says, does not bud, there are no grapes on the vines, olive crop fails, the fields produce no food, no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, right? Yet, there's that word again, yet, I will trust. And in the time of the, that this was written, Habakkuk's time, think about this. All your wealth, everything you had, was in crops, livestock. Without this, no food, no way to keep producing food, no store up for the future, uh, this would be like economic meltdown. All these things went down, as Habakkuk described. Uh, all sources gone, income, food. Uh, and how would you face this? I believe it's easy to acknowledge the goodness of God when things are going well. But what about when everything falls apart? Will you still say, like Habakkuk says, as we will get, to, yet I will rejoice. Right? Things are going well. Food, shelter, money in the bank. Yeah. Oh, God's good. Yeah, we got this, God. Or maybe you're just saying, I got this, God. Thanks for, you know, being on the sideline. But when everything is gone, and Habakkuk again makes that choice, yet I will rejoice. In verse 18, yet I will rejoice. So hope is here, joy is here, even on dark days. Uh, not just joy in my circumstances. And there were no circumstances that were going to be good in Habakkuk's time. Let's just put it clearly here. Um, but uh, circumstances. Um, things are well, you're up, not well, you're down. Joy is in money, in, in, in the stock market, uh, health relationships, all this joy can be fleeting if it's all in these things that could be gone at an instant. So it, it asks us to think about what is my foundation? And if these things are gone, how do you rebuild? Because if your hope is in temporary things, how long is it going to last? And Habakkuk, and as believers have continued to affirm throughout the centuries, they have gone through sometimes horrific things uh, about tr and finding true joy 
found in the promises of God, the unchanging promises of God, that through faith in Christ I am his child, and there's nothing that can remove me from his love. I just continually just think and pray for uh, people that are persecuted for their faith, and I think about, among others, those in Afghanistan, but there's other places throughout the world, in African countries and other places, where there's a lot of pain, suffering, even unto death, and I think about their standing on the Word of God, even, even though life be taken away. And that deep, deep down joy, that security that's found in the Lord, even if everything was lost, that foundation is found in Christ. And uh, reminders throughout Scripture, right, that, that uh, house that's built on the rock is the one that stands. We're not immune from storms and trials, but if our joy and our hope and our foundation is in Christ, we will stand. I'd like to help us look to where our joy can be found uh, and just continue to amplify that as we, as we go through these last uh, thoughts. But look to Jesus. Receive his strength and peace. And verse 19 of our, our reading for today says, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on to the heights. And uh, to go on the heights. Uh, just as we pause about and think about that, how can we do this? Well, what is truly in our hearts? What's, where is our foundation? Uh, where has it been? Because I believe dark days don't change what's inside us, but they more reveal what's inside us. So when the dark days come, where, what is revealed? Where is your foundation, right? When those dark days come, and is that foundation in the unchanging promises of God? Otherwise, when dark days come, it's, if our foundation, our heart is founded on something else, who knows what our reaction will be. And as we see Habakkuk's testimony, rejoicing even in a time of sorrow, uh, it's like uh, being able to see from that perspective of the mountaintops. And that's what you did in, in the ancient times, right? You went up to the highest place. If there was the enemies were around, you wanted to be up at the highest point so you could see. You could identify what was coming. And it's not easy to get up to the high place, but when you're up, you can't be attacked. If you're at the highest point, you can see for miles. You can prepare for the attack of an enemy. And we saw back in chapter 2, Habakkuk went up to a tower to see to get perspective. And if we rest in him, if we're secure in him, if we have secure footing in Christ, and as we see, as Habakkuk affirmed with God's promises, to go up to those heights with God's help. Go up to that perspective that God would bring us to. And when you're walking on the mountaintops with him, with secure footing, you're safe. And he admits, Habakkuk, I can't get there on my own, right? It's got to be God. It has to be uh, God's strength to give me the feet of a deer, to get me there. And look at what Habakkuk recounted, even as we looked at last week. Uh, we heard Habakkuk recall God's deliverance, even of his people in the time of Exodus and the, the, the freedom from slavery, the parting of the Red Sea, getting the people into the promised land, victory after victory from their enemies. And so it's God. God is my salvation. And as we reflect on the, the, the depth of God's love that he showed us in Christ, and we see the cross of Christ, we see ultimately what Habakkuk points us to, us to points the people to, ultimately leads us to Christ. And I'd like this to affirm this next verse from Hebrews 12, 2. If you'd like to read it with me, I encourage you to read this out loud with me. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, 2. And I'd like us to think about that word joy that's there. The joy before him, the joy that was set before him, allowed Jesus to endure the dark day of the cross. And you think about what joy 
did Jesus have? Well, that joy was you. That joy was me. We are his joy. Everything that was done was done for us. Taking sin, wrath, shame for us. Taking our sorrows, grief, pain, all was done for us. And Jesus, you could say, suffered well. He endured uh, for us. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't suffer well. I don't enjoy pain, hardship, sorrow, even getting sick. Just ask my wife, how do I do when I get sick? But Jesus did suffer well for the joy set before him. Even death couldn't conquer him. And on that third day, he defeated death. He's ruling, he's reigning, he's coming again to that day. There will be no more sorrow, no more tears. And we have this hope, don't we, brothers and sisters? We have this hope, this unshakable hope. All by God's grace. And he's given us his spirit to live within us, to dwell within us, to encourage us, to comfort us, to remind us of what is true about God and what is true about us. And I ask you, I ask myself as I think about our ultimate prayer, will you and I embrace this reality, this reality of God's uh, presence, of his comfort? Even going back to chapter 1, do you remember what Habakkuk's name means? It means embrace. And ultimately Habakkuk embraced the plan, the will of God. And we, and my prayer for us is that we would learn to embrace God's plan, God's care, God's control, no matter what comes in life. As we embrace this reality that Jesus Christ took the cross for you and me, that God's given us his Holy Spirit, that we might have rest, peace, even in the midst of trembling, the darkest of days. Brothers and sisters, have you given your heart and your life to Jesus? Have you given him that situation that you're facing right now that maybe you need to go into today, tomorrow, maybe sometimes not knowing what the outcome will be? Are you willing to hand that to him, to entrust that care, that burden to another brother or sister that would walk with you, that would pray with you? That's the invitation he offers. No matter what life circumstances may have brought you or me, trust in Jesus. Take a step of faith away from just yourself and having to do it all on your own. Bring it to Jesus, the one who will never leave you or forsake you. The one who saves you, who is with you, who is for you. I'd like us to pray in a moment. I want us to first address a couple of questions that would get you reflecting on this today. And thinking about a couple of things. One, how do I process what I'm feeling on dark days? Do I even acknowledge what I'm feeling? Or do I just put it you know, back in some closet of my mind, right? Express it to Jesus. He'll give you peace. Uh, where do I tend to look for rest and joy when I'm faced with hard things? Do I go to God or do I go to other things? And what happens when those other things fail or leave? And then finally, how can relying on Jesus, who endured dark days for me, empower me to experience rest and joy, even when things are falling apart? And trust those promises that he is with you, that he is for you.